Konnichiwa. Welcome to the Jandals in Japan podcast. Hey, Catherine. Hi, Jane. Kia ora. Konnichiwa. I see that you've been quite busy hanging out with Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern when she visited Japan recently. Oh, yes. And tell us about that. What happened? What, did, what were you up to? I was just so delighted to have been asked to be the MC at the keynote address that she had with the Japan Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Tokyo Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Gosh, it was really only about three weeks ago. And it was just fantastic just to meet her again. We'd met in 2019, just before Rugby World Cup, when I emceed for her uh, luncheon address there. And it was just fantastic. I represented the Australia New Zealand Chamber of Commerce in my vice chair role, and as my role as I am in my legal practice. But it was really great to see her and just because New Zealand and Japan are now entering the 70th anniversary of diplomatic relations this year, it's the anniversary, there's so much that's gone under the bridge uh, in relationships and just to build on that, build on that bridge for what's coming further forward. It was her first trip overseas since the pandemic started, that decision to come to Tokyo. Mm -hmm. I mean, it reflects, I think, the genuineness and the importance and the priority that New Zealand puts on the Japan-New Zealand relationship. And it's really a great way to accelerate this reopening of New Zealand to the world again. Thankfully, now New Zealand is also bringing back tourists and um, starting this education again uh, with students coming in. So that was part of what she was talking about when she gave her address was bringing back that severely affected tourism industry, and students and you know she met down at um cookie time didn't she you saw her yes, on at cookie I saw time she was at cookie time with some young people were they people who were planning to go or had come back they had come back they had mm. had that working holiday experience mm. japanese who'd gone to new zealand and she was talking with them about their experiences and that was really important so regenerating that working holiday scheme between new zealand and japan and also there were lots of business things so many things um, but one of them was, you know, generating around green hydrogen and New Zealand's investment in geothermal energy. And of course, Japan has its fair share of geothermal, mm. but they don't always have the expertise that New Zealand has with the innovation of how to leverage that. Um, I don't know if you've seen any green hydrogen buses running around the town, Jane, when you've been in Tokyo, but there are quite a few now. And so New Zealand's oh, really? getting involved mm. in that. So there's lots and lots there. Um, that's a bit of it. I'd love to share some more as we go through the episodes. But of course, it was just brilliant to see her. She did a great delivery of, of her address. And she also spoke about women in the workplace. And I just loved that particular segment. And hopefully we can share that particular bit a bit later as well. Yes. 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 I watched that and it was like, boom, mic drop moment kind of great stuff. So yes, we'll yeah. look forward to sharing that in the future. So we're getting into May now, and that means something is right around the corner. Yes, that drastic, drastic rainy season. Rainy season, yes. Now, people don't like rainy season. I actually, you know, I call it drastic, but actually I really like it. I don't mind rainy season so much, but um, Japan is oh. so geared up for the seasons, aren't they? I mean, our yes, last uh, episode, we talked a lot about that, didn't we? Se uh, episode four, wasn't it? Mm, native sparkling and there are seasonal beverages and we had some interesting ideas and our listeners will have piped in for some interesting ideas too but oh, that's the first time I've heard anyone say that they like rainy season oh I don't mind it because I actually like the sound of the rain and we've got but what stuff. about like the humidity though it's oh, off the charts yeah I don't, I don't know, know that I worry so much about that now I used to when I first arrived in Japan but after 20 uh rainy seasons I'm doing pretty okay with them now because Japan so seasonally based and so they have a lot of products out on the market you know the rain rain boots yeah, rain everything. gum boots yeah. what they call rain boots I think lovely umbrellas um it's raining last night and someone remarked on the cute umbrella I had I said wow mm. you can get it from here you know <laughs> they, they really think about the seasons mm. so well and so I yeah. don't find it is hard to approach because Japan is set up well for every season right mm. maybe it's just my trauma of having to try and get four people's laundry dry in rainy uh, season without it yeah. turning stinky 
and to take my dog out for a walk in, <laughs> in the rain. And perhaps that's influencing my feelings around the rainy season. Probably. Try to approach <laughs> this year, Jane, with a bit more of Catherine's approach to mm, I'm going to get myself a cute rainy umbrella. Season. and <laughs> get, get the cute umbrella, get the cute boots. Cute but, I boots, mean, we do yeah. talk about seasonality, and I think you – often talk about the seasons and the, the foods and things that you like in each season. And I think it's always a chance for businesses that are from New Zealand to angle their products mm. into Japan according to the seasons. Because New Zealand doesn't really do that, do they? True. No, no. You can go to the supermarket and see similar products all year long in New Zealand, but we definitely do have the seasonality across all areas of consumption. Here in Japan. I think you, New Zealand, you will slap on Christmas or slap on Easter and have a product, have products for that, but they're not mm. as specific. They I don't change though. It's still the change. same cookie or yeah. the same chocolate bar. Right. Perhaps a little bit of uh, Easter labeling. Or yeah, yeah. Labeling. Different labeling. Yeah. Right. So I don't well, speaking it. of cookies. Yes. 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 <laughs> Our guest for today is coming up. Yeah, and it's all about cookies. I mean, I normally don't have cookies on the mind, truly, mm, but mm. since we have been talking with our lovely guest, Jason Allen, who's the representative director of Cookie Time in Japan, we've been thinking a lot about cookies. And mm -hmm. I've been con whoops, consuming a few too <laughs> off my health <laughs> uh, regime, but there we go. I mean, there's absolute gold in this episode because he talks about the seasons and how it matters mm. in Japan, mm. even selling yeah. Cookie Time here. And he talks about distribution network in Japan and about packaging for Japan, talking about how people consume their products and how they go on business trips and bring back omiyage, bring back souvenirs, and how that way of delivering to each person in the office really matters and the way that they are doing their packaging according to for Japan. I love this episode. Here we have uh, Jason from Cookie Time. Yay! Kia ora. Konnichiwa. Here we are on the Jandals in Japan podcast. And I'd really love to welcome Jason Allen. Jason, welcome to the show. Good morning. Hello. Thank you. Well, the reason we invited you on the show is you've been on the ground here for a very, very long time. Uh, you've got a wealth of experience in Japan. And when it comes to getting really successful in Japan with New Zealand products, you know, you're the person who comes to mind. Not only have you managed to establish a brick and mortar store in the trendy heart of Tokyo in Harajuku, you've also got Cookie Time Cookies here and Tom and Luke and a few other brands. And you've been also expanding into various iconic chain stores in Japan. And we really think you'd be a key guest to come on to the Jandals in Japan podcast because we know you've got insights and you'll be able to help a lot of Kiwis and other business owners come into Japan. So I really just want to thank you for spending your time with us to come on the show. But first of thank all, you. we have a very important question for you. <laughs> a or B, which are you? Bed or futon? <laughs> uh, bed. I was a futon for a while, uh, but now definitely a bed. Why is that? Well, two young children... 45-year-old Bones, the current apartment we were in is not, like I used to live in a traditional house that had those, you know, big, deep cupboards that you could like roll the futon up and poke it in and it was an easy thing to do. Ah, the Oshida, but, yeah, the, the yeah, futon the cupboard, modern, yeah. The modern mm. apartment just doesn't have that. So then they just get stuck sitting out. And then, of course, if you don't look after them, you know what happens to the floor and the bottom of the futon. Yes. So, mm -hmm. um, yes. so we're a bed. We're a bed people. We're a bed people. I'm a bed person too. Yeah, all the way. Futons are yeah. hard work. They mm. are such hard work. People don't know that, right? In New Zealand, you think, oh, futons, yeah, cool. Oh. But actually, so much work and yeah. hauling things around and dust and all sorts of things. Yeah. Yes. How about you, Catherine? Bed or oh, futon? Oh, I'm definitely a bed now. I do remember, Jason, back in Osaka when I first met you, you were on a futon, I think, in that yeah. older house that you were living in, that very yeah. sort of Japanese-looking house. Funnily yeah. enough, I did have a futon back in Christchurch, and it was so heavy. I don't know what I was thinking. I thought it was cool to own a futon. Mm. But now, yeah. bed all the way. <laughs> yeah, but too. I do. I just rem remembering reliving the futon experiences. It is quite neat rolling to. It's so easy to roll out of bed in the morning from a futon. Very low down. 
Um, and there's something cozy about a futon. I mean, I, I'm just thinking back about futons. I like them a lot, but yeah, not with two young kids. And I do love family. them at a real con, right? When you you walk in the room, it's the yeah. tummy, and they've made it up for you, and it's just yeah, take me away to the futon. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Wow. When I when I visit my parents in law, it's futon central down there. But I always have at least three or four stacked up to get the right sort of level of yeah, comfort exactly. to survive the time that we're staying there. Yeah. yeah. So it's more the kake futon, right? What goes on top that's the more delicious part of the futon mm, experience, I feel. Mm, yeah. Yeah. yeah true. Well, no, we- there we go. We're all <laughs> we're all honing in on the bed rather than the futon. And and Jason, we will be putting your full bio in the show notes later on. But do start us off with telling us about your inspiration for doing business in Japan. Uh, you've been here a long time. Why did you choose Japan? Yeah, so um, I mean, wasn't really business um, related initially. It was just language. So I studied the language in New Zealand in Christchurch at the Polytechnic, which had a great course. Uh, you know, a well-respected Japanese course um, back when I was wanting to learn Japanese. And then I struggled through a couple of years of that, and it really wasn't until the last year that I decided that this is perhaps what I wanted. You know, I wanted to come to Japan and perhaps work in Japan in the future that I got serious about studying so in the third year I did some work and and then the polytech actually sent me over to Japan for a year at a university up in, uh, in Osaka um, so that was my basic kind of language skills training and then I went back uh, home for a while and applied for the JET program um, so obviously the JET program is probably quite well known by many uh, it's a Japanese kind of government program that mainly English teachers or ALTs but I did the CIR um, side of the JET program. Um, so I was fortunate enough to get accepted onto that and ended up in Osaka in a city called Sakai, which has a sister city relationship with Wellington. And so I was there for three years. So then I was kind of well and truly on my way to being indoctrinated. <laughs> um, and then when I stepped from the, out of the JET program, I actually got another three-year contract with the prefectural government. Um, it was a private contract, non-JET, but doing similar CIR work. So basically in total, I spent six years working for it, working for local government in Japan. Wow. So a really good grounding in in language and and culture and yeah. And then during the during the third, the second or the the last three years or the private contract with um the prefectural government, I I did things on the side like exported cars, imported wine, imported water, um, got involved with some honey. So I was kind of like back then I was already kind of bridging New Zealand and Japan and food and beverage and yeah so that was kind of my start and then yeah I actually went back home for a while and then came back to and did something a bit different when that was to interpret for a rugby team for a year I had the basic reading and writing and my Japanese level was was okay it was adequate then but another year interpreting which was put in some difficult circumstances and my Japanese was challenged um, was also character building I think but following that, I did. Um, I stayed with rugby, but I ended up looking after some rugby players um, as an agent, as a player agent, and negotiating some contracts. So that was neat. And then again, while I was doing that, I was still involved with other New Zealand product, Honey in particular. Um, and then assisted Mojo. Mojo is the coffee chain in New Zealand. Many will know. And they arrived to Japan, and my Japanese business partner got involved with them quite early on. I moved across to to Mojo for for a couple of years as well, for a year and a half and established the roastery and the little coffee shop uh, we had in Kagurazaka. And then when Cookie Time uh, was making noises about entry into Japan through a licensed partner, um, a Japanese license licensee, I was involved in some of those early discussions. And then when that looked like it was going to be established, I went to the Japanese company and asked if I could assist. And so they employed me, and that's basically where it started. Wow. So it sounds like you were very instrumental in in your career in Japan, making things happen across all kinds of things, like getting that contract with the Osaka prefecture, Mm. rugby. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Like representing rugby players. There's a lot of sort of having to put yourself out there and do stuff. Even if you you don't know what you're doing, kind of she'll be right. Kind of mindset served you well to get where you are today with cookie time. That's amazing. Yeah, I think so. I mean, Kiwis in particular kind of a little bit, sync in with the 
the local environment. So I've never kind of really pushed back against things. So that helps. And then that DIY attitude you talked about, Jane, that definitely helps. Yeah, it's been a really interesting journey, but none of it has been under kind of felt um, like a, any under, any, under any pressure and just been really enjoyable. Lots of challenges too, I imagine, on the way, as you said, with the rugby, but you're resilient, I think. And so is that part of the success story for you and really generally for people who want to do well in Japan? Yeah, I think so. Years ago, I was like four Ps I came up with, I thought that were necessary to succeed here. And I can't remember the fourth for the life of me, but definitely like patience, persistence, a little bit of persuasiveness, but not that bold, brash persuasiveness. You know, the Japanese might refer to it as the nemawashi, or like tending the roots, you know, making sure that things are, you, you've got things aligned in a direction in which you want to go. You need to have everyone on board. And that often takes time, which is the part of the patience part. Yeah, I think those are characteristics that, that can help you be successful here. And I think as Kiwis, you know, as New Zealanders, we were not all built the same, but I think that some of the those characteristics are common through many of us. So what was the fourth one? Patient. I got patience, persistence, persuasiveness, and... I, don't, I can't re- bloody remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe, you know I maybe Pinot. <laughs> ah, Pinot Noir. Must have been, yeah. Must be Pinot Noir. When you Come on, I know you love it very, very much. So it might have been that, actually, but... Um, it might have been Pinot. Patience, persistence, and persuasiveness. I love those. And I'm sure during those six years down at... Uh, the local council, the local government Mm. office, you would have learned a lot about patience with the paper shuffling that can go on. Maybe P was paper shuffling. (laughs) Might have been two could have been. Paperwork, yeah. Wow, I love it that you're saying, you know, there's that the Kiwis are not all, we're not all built the same, but we have this sort of X factor, I guess. And is there something really about that X factor to make Kiwis successful here? What does it take for a Kiwi to be successful in Japan? Yeah, well, I think it takes those things I just mentioned, those Ps, but building a network. And, I mean, that takes time as well. That's the patience part too. But um, and I'll talk a little bit more about, you know, the business we're doing now um, with New Zealand Food and Beverage and just how over time it feels like you almost, you get knitted into the web or the fabric here. That has some good and bad things, you know, <laughs> It takes time to get knitted into the fabric or weaved into the fabric. But once you're weaved in, it's very difficult to get untangled from it too. So as long as you, in in the case of what we do here in Japan now, have quality food and beverage products, uh, have a quality network, I think you're on the way to to success. Yeah, so it's a quality, solid foundation being built from there, right? That's the important point. And that's really interesting because you talk about your products like Cookie Time Cookies are also available in Seijo Ishi, Kinokuniya, 7-Eleven. And just how did you get those quality products into huge chain stores like that? And why those particular chain stores did you select them? We didn't select them. Well, we didn't select them, but we've been nine years in Japan now. The shops, the retail shop in Harajuku has been in this location for nine years. So... We were retail focused basically for the first six years, five or six years. And the idea was to have more than one store. Um, we did it. We did it one stage. We had we had a store in Tokyo Station in the Kite, Kite building for one year. And then we had another store in a shopping center, Tokyo, Tokyo with the Tokyo group in Futago Tamagawa, um, which was in the B1, the food, food show area. And that was there for a year as well. So we had the main, we had the antenna shop in Harajuku. We had satellite stores and we did a lot of pop-ups as well. Yeah, we learned a lot from from them. And then we basically, we, we reached a point where we didn't think we were extracting all of the potential that we could out of Haraj, the Harajuku store. And the other, and the pop-ups and the other kind of stores were, could, could be described as a distraction requiring human resource to run. So we actually cut them all off and then we focused on the, Harajuku store for a couple of years and rebuilt its foundation. Yeah, and we were able to uh, lift da- total average daily sales, lift unit spend, and just improve the general kind of delivery of the service, I think, in Harajuku. Um, once we had that on tracks, we went to online. So we established online channels on the marketplaces and also our JP site. We had some fun there for 12 months. And then we basically moved straight to wholesale. And that's always really been the goal or the focus. I think it is for a lot of 
you know, manufacturers or people sitting up over here have a retail present to establish a kind of a beachhead you use online for visibility mainly. It's quite often very difficult to, to drive good profit from that channel, from that online channel. Um, and then you, you target wholesale once you have some credibility, trust and market. So that was our journey. And then our first actual wholesale start was with Natural Lawson, the petite or the kind of premium chains within the Lawson group. That was kind of actually initiated by a contact through New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. So NZTE has, has been amazing ally for us in market over the years. It's actually myself and Rie, I think, um, Rie Maki, who's been with us for seven years. She was at the first meeting, she took that first meeting with Natural Lawson. So we sold in two types of cookies, I think, two flavors. We sold in a chocolate chunk cookie and we sold in a salted caramel cookie. And But before we could do that, we had a few hurdles. And those were, um, our cookies, typically most keepers would know, are quite short shelf life. So only 90 days, which is incredibly short. Like to give an indication, most cookies in this market are at least nine months, probably nine to 12 mm. months. So we, were, we always knew we were going to struggle I'll have some difficulties with the supply chain because obviously in Japan, many will know too, you don't deal direct with the retailers, you go through distributors. And so they filter everything and they also, you know, expect to have shelf life to work with. And we often couldn't offer them that. So we developed a cookie that was 150 days. So that's the two flavors I mentioned, the chocolate chip and the salted caramel. And then we had a, we had this cute um, display box, um, 16 cookies in the display box and we started there and it was really well received and we had an amazing and we still do to a certain extent an amazing relationship with natural Lawson and we didn't just sell them in those two SKUs we participated in occasions so we did like end of aisles for Easter uh, we did three or four SKUs for Christmas we celebrated the anniversary by creating these really cool badges which were collab you know branded natural Lawson and cookie time yeah we just went out of our way we had amazing comms with them we had and really nurtured that relationship. That was kind of the starting point for us. And then from that, after Natural Lawson, though, we once you once you appear on shelf, other buyers are you know around about looking at what's popping up. We sold into Caldi and we sold into New Days as well. Quite quick succession after the Natural Lawson launch. Interesting um, that that people uh, buyers are looking at what other shops have got and they will come to you because you've yeah. gone over that first hurdle. And then, yes, that's right. Yeah. Because when they see you in market, you've you've passed a few tests. Um, you've been able to establish an account directly or with a distributor that functions for that chain. You've basically ticked enough boxes to get on shelf. So once others see that, you know, you've built some trust or credibility in market. You've kind of, you've been validated. So then it's much easier, I think, they think it is to approach you. And so typically they don't approach you directly, but you'll get a phone call from the distributor and or, you know, it might not be the retailer. The distributors might also be looking around, seeing what other chains are doing and then taking that story to, to the retail chains that they service. Once you pop up and you have some visibility in market, you become much, obviously much more visible and that has a bit of a, a run on effect. Mm, that's some key information there. Mm. That is really amazing. And so literally you get a phone call, not a fax or a, <laughs> an email. It, it literally is somebody calling. So you've got to pick up those phones when they ring. Yeah, you yeah. You need a fax true. machine d- these days. Oh, hell, you need a fax. Yeah, because yeah. How, how on earth would they order from you? Really? Um, they fax. I'm we get a lot of faxes. Honestly? We are paperless though, so we have a digital fax system. Okay. Um, right. that, that digitizes the fax. Is that the right word? They fax, we get an email. Right, yes. Um, and then we send that email back that goes to their fax. <laughs> technology. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? Is there a name for this technology? Is it that if someone was looking for it, what's it called? Uh, we, use, we used e-fax. E-fax, okay. Um, <laughs> and then we use another <laughs> provider now. But it functions well enough. Mm. But after- it allows us to avoid the fax and that pinging noise, you know, that Ching, seems, so, noise, yes. seems so ancient now. For sure. So do they actually then visit you after that, make an appointment and come and see you? Or is it pretty quick then for the next step when they get you on there? It takes, again, this patience is coming through. Nothing is quick, Kath, little- as you would know. <laughs> it takes a while. <laughs> it takes a while. Yeah, nothing is quick. 
yeah, they'll call and then you'll send samples or they'll set up a meeting. I mean, pr- prior to COVID, it was all, you know, everyone would set up a meeting. So you'd set up a meeting. Often you wouldn't meet the, the retail chain buyers at that stage. You might just meet the sh- distributor. But we wanted to be, you know, we were running retail here. You know, we want to be as close to the consumer as possible. So when we were talking about, our, you know, dreams to go into wholesale, we're like, and we knew we had to work through distributors. We were kind of adamant right from the beginning that we needed to be in touch with the retail buyers. We needed to know exactly what was happening on the ground, you know, on the shelf, because if we lost contact with the consumer, it was dead. And so we were really early on, we were adamant about that. They did actually link us to that happened. We'd have the conversations and Rhea and I, you know, would pitch at the early pitches because we were part of, we were doing the sales in those days. We we're, uh, were in love with, obviously, we would you know, 100% cookie time. So we story tell and we never had anyone say no to us. But that was kind of how it happened. And then obviously over time, though, you get the product in, but it's got to battle hard on shelf to stay. In Natural Lawson, for example, they told me they have 12 new SKUs enter their chains every week. So that's not 12 SKUs just in snacking or confectionery. That's across the whole store. But I mean, the stores, as you know, the footprints are quite small. I mean, there would be, there's hundreds and hundreds of SKUs, you know, wine and nuts or whatever it may be. But every week there's 12 new SKUs. So to basically stay on shelf, it's incredibly competitive. You know, you've got to have a, a fairly decent run rate in our category, for example, that might be three to four units a week. Um, that it might also be a statistic that those familiar with food and beverage in New Zealand are like gaping open mouth. Because I know, I think run rates in New Zealand, for example, in supermarkets are much higher. So you have this dichotomy is that I don't know. It's kind of like Japan, such a massive, huge market, you know, and the potential for our product once it's listed is just going to be phenomenal. Um, and we had that too. Like we were like in natural, then we're all in Kaldi. And we're like, oh my God, holy shit, we need stock. We need containers mm. of product. Jesus, <laughs> all of that stuff. Um, and then and then you get run rates at three, you know, and then run rates might slip down and then you might get shuffled across or you might not be on there. You might just be what they call a spot product, which is quite common too. You're in and out. Mm. Um, but they don't tell you this. Now, they might have if we'd asked the right questions, but at the time, you know, who are we to know what the right questions were to ask? And so we were, you know, a little bit, we went a little bit blind. So we, we had a lot of learnings in those early, in that early year or, or two, which again, I think, you know, ties back to those three Ps, patience, persistence and persuasiveness. Yeah, another thing I should mention, obviously the time factor thing. So a lot of businesses, I think when they come to Japan or go into foreign markets, expect to see, activity and results immediately. Now, we're really fortunate, of course, that in behind us, we have a cookie time in New Zealand, which is a 38, 40, 39, almost 40 year established, well-established business manufacturer. You know, you've got to have deep pockets too. I think when you're sitting up here, you want to be aware of the time factor and you want to be sure that where you start, the starting point is sustainable or that you can actually go the distance because some New Zealand manufacturers or have had big successful win, say in China, heading in and, you know, six to 12 months and, you know, quite quick. On the flip side though, quite quickly out as well, I believe. But it comes back to that thing in Japan, it takes time to weave yourself into the fabric. But once you're weaved in, you definitely see success, but it takes time. So just make sure that where you start from is sustainable and you're in it for the longer time frame. And, you know, you mentioned Rhea and myself, Kath, but, you know, now we have some really smart credentials in the sales space, especially in wholesale, because it is a real, like it's a bloody, the logistics system and the the tiered, the layered, the tiers of just access to market is quite complicated. It's a maze. And so Rhea Re- and I were, you know, lucky enough to kind of get out, put a dip out, dip our toes in the water and have some early success. But I think if you're really focused on cracking the market, so to speak, you need some smarts. And we've got a, the, our first sales hire was a 63 year old guy. He's probably the most youthful of us all. He's got incredible energy <laughs> uh, and he's just got say, you know, his sales DNA and he knows exactly how the market ticks and just tapping into it every day. And then we've recently got a, a younger sales guy uh, just joined us in February. 
he was with me at Mojo for about six months before I left. So I've known him for many years and he, he's going to add incredible value to our sales team too. So, you know, we still battle every day. It's difficult. It's hard work. But I think, you know, if you persist, persist at it and are patient uh, and persuasive, um, then you can see success. I wanted to, to sort of segue, is that all right, if we move yeah. into talking a little bit more about Harajuku and mm. where you are in Tokyo. And for those people who've never been to Harajuku, can you explain a little bit about what was the idea about getting a shop in that particular part of Tokyo, which has some of the biggest food trends happening in Japan, changing constantly you know, this yeah. week it's rainbow candy floss. Next week it's, yeah. you know, bubble tea or like those tornado potato things, those whirly potato yeah. things, right? You, know, you walk around with it, shoe creams or something. What was the idea about getting it into Harajuku and what's it been like trying to stay relevant there? For those, all those reasons, I think, you know, when we were entering Japan, Harajuku was kind of top of mind and was definitely a target. This area was a target for us because Harajuku is a, a small district in Tokyo, basically sandwiched between Shibuya and Shinjuku. And it's a very hip um, youth fashion, trendy. I um, mean, you know, a lot of stuff is kind of born out of Harajuku. It has rich history. We've only been here for nine years, so I'm not familiar with all of its history, but I've seen old uh, books that showcase Harajuku and it's been a breeding ground or for that kind of fashion, you know, fashion and hippie fashion and trends for many years. So yeah, we were Coming from New Zealand, we were a hot cookie shop. We had a character. We had Poppy Creative. So it made sense that we would try and find a home here. And we were lucky enough to, to secure the site. So just going back to the early days of Cookie Time, it was a licensee partner agreement. We had a licensee partner in Japan. So Cookie Time New Zealand signed the license agreement with the Japanese partner. Um, and for the first two years, I worked for that Japanese company. Um, and that was when we, we established the, the shop. Over, the, over those first two years and run a lot of pop-ups and run some other satellite stores too. Then in the third year, the licensee partner basically sold or Cookie Time New Zealand came back into Japan and bought the business back. And so at that point in time, I became the window to the new business here. We established a, an entity in Japan and I became the window to that. Yeah, so we were in hindsight quite lucky to find the site and it was obviously the, the Japanese partner played a huge role in that. Um, finding this location and setting the contracts up. And, and so, yeah, we're, we're still here after nine years. Must be old timers in Harajuku, perhaps nine years. Yeah. And then you said, Jane, you know, staying relevant. So true. Every kind of second week seems to be a new fad. We make sure that we participate in occasions. So we're always present Valentine's, White Day, Christmas, Halloween, Easter. You know, we've always got something new and flashy. And, and that provides content for social media. And social media is a kind of frequency that's how we I don't know running at whatever megahertz it may be that's how we let everybody know that we're still relevant or doing something that's fresh and they need to pop back and see us so for example though like one of the most successful campaigns we ever had was a was a weekly freak shake at the beginning of cookie time we had a we had a simple shake it was a vanilla chocolate cookie shake and then we developed these freak shakes which were kind of mind-blowing you know food, porn, cream, and all sorts of stuff. Um, very visual. I okay, became very social media. Um, Insta-buy cent- friendly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We ran a kind of a weekly freak shake over the summer for, I think, six weeks. Uh, that was probably one of our most successful campaigns. So, again, that might give an indication on just how how constant the innovation needs to be and just how, yeah, just how you use social and influencers to and influence as well to drive that kind of story. Because I was going to ask you how you nurture and delight your clients and customers, but I'm I'm hearing from you that it's through that relevancy, it's through being there, participating in those occasions, and you definitely are there. Is that is that how it is? Is there something else that you're doing to help nurture and delight your customers in Japan? Cookie time. It has a mantra or a few mantras, but one of those mantras is to surprise and delight. So what we do here is part of that as well. So, yeah, we're always looking to over-deliver. We try to do that mainly through the products or the, you know, the the yummy products that we have and make sure that they they want to come back. And yeah. I noticed you've jumped on this trend of vegan and plant-based. After a, a little bit of time between tasting your product, I went and had one of those. 
uh, the plant-based one and the vegan one. And I could hardly tell the difference. It seems, you know, Japan's being taken over by this vegan and vegetarian and plant-based food culture, which is absolutely wonderful to hear. And it's already got origins in that anyway, it's sort of deviated and now coming back. Is that a really important area for you? Is that another way to delight and move yeah, on? No, I think, yeah, I think so, Kath. Yeah, it's happened a little bit in the shop. It's happened a little bit by default. Um, obviously, in New Zealand, it's a trend, a strong trend. And so, therefore, by therefore we have those products in New Zealand. So, we're able to source them for Japan. But there's no doubt that that trend and that wave is coming. Um, and I think it is going to be incredibly valuable for us, um, especially in this wholesale. I mean, we're still constantly in taking um, wholesale conversations daily and gluten-free and vegan, plant-based, you know, fruit, natural, no sugar. There's all sorts of, you know, key words amongst some of the product lineups or the brands that we manage now. And so those are often the key conversations that we have in wholesale. We start a key conversation in wholesale. Yeah, as you say, they're a great product, aren't they? And often it's, you know, people associate vegan or gluten-free products with something that's inferior but no our cookies are really good um, they are they got me through university through law school literally every uh break at 10 o'clock between lectures <laughs> my friend Tans and I were down in the cafe having cookie time and then it was sort of a sausage roll every now and then so you know you've really um been there forever and because it's a Christchurch brand originally right and you you and I are both from there it sort of has a, a real deep pull in the heart but I noticed too you've got other healthy snacks and other options like Tom and Luke uh, the snack balls the original and some new collagen variety I, I see are about to land in the land of the rising sun you've also got bumper stick and kindly uh, dried apple fruit sheets why did you decide to expand into those other New Zealand brands into this yeah. you know cookie time family so Cookie Time originally actually manufactured um, a Bliss Ball as well. It was under the bumper brand. So we have in New Zealand the bumper bars and the sticks. Under the bumper brand, we used to have a bumper Bliss Ball. Um, and the market in New Zealand, yeah, as you may know, is incredibly competitive in that ball snacking mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. um, and Tom and Luke are a leader in that space. So um, at one stage, Tom and Luke and Cookie Time had a mutual, the beneficial relationship manufacturing Bliss Balls. Um, and so when we were looking, when we obviously we had we had started wholesale conversations with Cookie Time, and we while we were having these buy conversations, we were tuned into you know needs or consumer wants, and and one of them was kind of felt like this healthy snacking trend was going to stick. Um, and so we were really keen to kind of look at these our bumper bliss balls, and it just so happened at the time that Tom and Luke were developing a a snacker ball that was a chocolate snacker ball or what they call the chocolate series. Um, and when we were weighing up, you know, how we would best deliver the balls to market, we really thought that this chocolate angle was a neat one because it meant that we could, um, it allowed us to pitch the, the product potentially in the confectionery space. So often in Japanese convenience, you have a healthy snacking section mm. and it's difficult. It's hard to know if that section is actually I mean, for a start, that probably track, attracts less foot traffic. So already we're targeting an audience that's smaller. So the idea was to have to pick up this chocolate snackable, to target it at the confectionery area, and to basically persuade the consumer that they had an option which was guilt-free. Mm. <laughs> so they were standing in front of chocolate, and they're like, mm, God damn it, you know, I want chocolate. And here we have chocolate per se chocolate flavored cacao mm. but it's got dates and yummy almonds and it's gluten-free and it's vegan and damn it actually tastes really good so mm. that was how we established tom and luke over here and very yeah, so clever had, yeah. yeah we had three flavors, three flavors orange dark orange cacao original uh and mint and then recently we've had a strawberry one um, and I thought that's all that was there. And then I went back to New Zealand and found these. I'm holding up on yeah, screen, they're good the peanut butter ones and also the salted caramel. Oh, my goodness. I'm wondering if these are coming in. They're very, very <laughs> yummy. Well, Kath, they're actually already out. No, so are they? We a, yeah, we had mm. a pop-up. You know, we had a pop-up shop recently for Tom and Luke. We wanted to basically take the chocolate balls into the Valentine's, that white day gifting space. Right. So we found a contract manufacturer in Japan that would individually wrap the balls. 
sorry, don't cringe because I know we're all mm. less plastic and but Japan has needs and wants and in the gifting space, it's individually wrapped. Yeah. So we found a contract manufacturer that individually wrapped the balls beautifully. It was amazing. We found this, we ad- adopted or built this cute pottle. Think naturally, just natural kind of cardboard pottle, but really firm, cleanly branded, put the individually wrapped balls in and they had three flavors and sold them at the pop-up. And the three flavors were actually new flavors, but still tied to cacao or chocolate. And that was the peanut butter one that Kath just held up, peanut butter cacao. Uh, another one called Kakao Nib, which I'm not sure if you've had yet, but that's amazing as well. And then a third one, which was a raspberry brownie. I think in New Zealand it's actually a raspberry beetroot brownie, but we weren't sure how beetroot would um, <laughs> take here. So we dropped beetroot and ran with raspberry brownie. I did have um, that in New Zealand and it was absolutely delicious. They're good, oh, eh? Great. Yeah, good, good yeah, one. Yeah, and mm. the, the pop-up shop was they were amazing feedback from consumers really successful well and yeah lots of learnings for you know next steps in wholesale and and potentially you know taking tom and luke further in that gifting space which good cookie time has really always been set up for that gifting space too with the package product that we have in the cookie bar so yeah. just uh, making sure that we can actually do the same thing for tom and luke uh, and you know hopefully the other brands as we move forward awesome yeah i love how you repackage you just went and repackaged the product and created this new thing to make it work in the japanese market for a special event when a lot yeah. of cookies and things get sold right the white day phenomena of japan where men return the the gifts that they will not return but they they pay back to the person who gave yes. them chocolate on valentine's day because in japan valentine's day is a day for women to give men chocolate Yes. And then in Japan, you must return something or give a return gift. And so if you didn't yes. have that knowledge of Japanese culture, there's it's a huge chance that would have been missed. But I'm sure your amazing background in Japan really helped to, to see that chance and see a chance yes. to, to repackage and, and make it yes. work in Japan and and become a, a, a loved brand through White Day. Yeah, that might be someone's first, yes. yeah. first yeah, time to saying- try one. Yeah, staying relevant. And there, as you know, Jane, my listeners may not, there are lots of other gifting um, opportunities in Japan and having a gifting lineup, which may be kind of secondary to your staple product or that your offer, I think is quite important because in the wholesale, for example, um, it allows our salespeople to bridge or to bridge the communication between, say, new products coming out because, you know, big manufacturers in Japan have basically shelf space locked down with the retailers and they're just constantly cycling in product and cycling out product. It's very difficult to move them or to wedge in to that space on the shelf. Therefore, you're fighting basically you as in us or other brands or secondary brands or third, you know, or imported brands are fighting for much less shelf, even quite a small amount of shelf space, which is incredibly competitive. And often you don't have, we don't have the new product cycle that, the Japanese manufacturers do. So to keep relevant as well and to keep the communication strong with the distribution partners and the retailers, it's definitely helpful um, to have product or stories like this, especially the one those that can participate in occasions for them, because often mm. those are those are needs that they need a, a solution for, or those are problems they need a solution for. And I think that, you know, by doing what we do, we help, we help provide that solution. It's so awesome. I just have to ask about the cookie muncher, yes. your red cookie, uh, yuru kiara, as kind of as they're yes. called in Japan, this big red cookie monstery thing. Has having your own character helped? It definitely has helped to assimilate us into Harajuku culture. <laughs> it's funny though, most people still would not be familiar with his name. So I think there's actually perhaps... Uh, a lot more we could do in the future and, and could have done to date perhaps to leverage the potential and the power of Cookie Muncher. Um, about two years ago, just prior to COVID, we had a we had established a relationship with Sanrio, the character company up here, and we'd set up a collaboration with our, we've got an iconic milk bottle in the cookie bar. Here's one here. It's branded very Kiwiana Flora. Um, but we'd done a milk bottle, some creative that, that had um, Cookie Muncher and the Sanrio characters. And we were delivering that just prior to the Olympics to the inbound audience. And I'm Mm. pretty sure it would have been a hit. So we had that in store and then we had this cute box um, 
with two cookies that were wrapped. It was a strawberry flavored cookie, I think, strawberry white chocolate. And it was a beautiful box. And that was again going into the looking to go into Lawson stores to target the inbound tourist market. So I think that that would have been a massive catalyst for elevating Cookie Muncher and his story and his connection to Cookie Time in Japan. Unfortunately, COVID kind of short, um, short circuited that. So we didn't end up executing that. But I think opportunities like that in the future still exist um, for Cookie Time and for Cookie Muncher. And I think Cookie Muncher in his own right is a strong, potentially a strong, powerful brand. Again, in the store currently, we don't have much merchandise that talks to Cookie Muncher. Uh, we should have a lot more and we could have a lot more. But again, it's just a, amongst the activity that we do currently in the business in Japan, it's not, not such a high priority. But I think in the future to support wholesale growth too, like as we spread perhaps wider, well beyond Tokyo, he should definitely be front and center potentially of that mm, journey for making time. some business so. trips. Will you have to put on the suit? Yes. Can, you'll have to <laughs> either right height to be a cookie muncher, not too, not too tall. Yes. Yeah. That looks like a tough job wearing the suit. Yeah. The cookie muncher suit. All righty. <laughs> All righty. So Catherine, any last questions? Well, I'm really interested in the crystal ball day oh, yes. thing we want to hear that crystal Jason ball. may have. What is in perhaps in Japan, Tokyo, in the F&B industry? What are you seeing coming down the pathways? You know, you hinted at it before, Kath, about vegan, gluten-free. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that sort of healthy snacking trend is definitely growing and gaining momentum. It's going to be difficult period. Um, Obviously, supply chain logistics issues still exist. I think um, inflation, you know, across many industries, I'm sure, but we're already feeling it in raw product, raw material product. In New Zealand, we're expecting price rises um, in the next three to six months and maybe more. In Japan, just in the last month, we've had two price rises from our milk supplier. So if that's any indication, I think that that's definitely something we're going to, that everyone, we're all going to have to tackle in the next six to 12 months. We're, we've got a little project at the moment, which I refer to as localizing the supply chain. In New Zealand, our manufacturers, Cookie Time as well, quite dislike small portion control wrapped product. It just does not fit our manufacturing lines. They hate it. <laughs> <laughs> They'll do it, um, but you'll pay for it. Um, And when we pay for it, obviously we have to prepare and pack it over here into a format that fits the consumer. And by the time you do that, you can often price it out of market. So it just does not work. So this has been something kind of a battle or a challenge for us over the years. And one thing we're looking to do with the Tom and Luke product, um, which is potentially a little unique, is to import more bulk and then to bespoke pack in Japan using lines here. And what we've discovered so far is that those lines actually exist and those lines are actually quite willing to discuss and to deal. And so we're not yet there, but we're well on our way to creating this, which is basically, um, yeah, bulk product in and various formats that are much better fit for market. And then we think that by doing this also, it's going to allow our salespeople to have really rich conversations around There'll always be minimum water quantities, but rich conversations around bespoke packaging for chain for chains. So it doesn't necessarily mean that every chain has to carry what what we're selling in or what we're pitching. No, we can actually have conversations around what best fits their you know consumer base or model. Because um, we know we have a great product, and I think we know that it can definitely travel both cookies and the balls and and the bump up and bumpers. Goddamn, bumpers good too. So we just, we have great product. We just need to really fit it to market. And I think this is one way potentially we can do this. And yeah, so that's a little project for us at the moment. So that's um, in our future. Very exciting. I mm. mean, this is a really amazing. And I'd love to also know if there's anything you've got that you would offer to anybody who's been listening right through to the end here. <laughs> there must be something that you can offer through from Cocky Time to our faithful listeners. Of course. So we're always running deals on our JP site, uh, cookietime.co.jp. We have all our brands represented. So Cookie Time, Tom and Luke, 
Kath mentioned bumper as well, which are the bumper bars. In Japan, we have the bumper sticks, uh, two flavors, uh, but a third flavor coming very soon. Mm-hmm. And Kai and Leah, which is a, in New Zealand, it's the Annie's product that um, listeners might be familiar with. It's a hundred percent fruit sheet, um, but we couldn't use the Annie's brand up here in Japan. So we're running it under the Kai and Leah uh, brand. So yeah, yeah, another yummy product. And then a few more in the pipeline. I won't mention them here, but we've got other brands uh, that are coming through as well in the next six to 12 months. Oh, so, exciting. Um, yeah, you guys, exciting. welcome to a discount on this online shop. Um, how about Jandal Time? Woo, okay. Thank you. Yeah, Jandal Time is like cookie time. It's a little mixture there, Jandal mm, Time. Yeah, I like yeah. that. <laughs> thank so you. I imagine a lot of our listeners are in Japan as well as in New Zealand. So if you're in Japan, you can take advantage of this. Right. Get your cookie time hit. And if you've been away from New Zealand for a long time, like I have, I think it's been nearly, it'll be nearly three years since I was back home. Yeah, getting yeah. a chance to order some cookie time to wherever you are in Japan will just be really, really nice. I think I'm just about crying here now. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. Uh, well, Jane, your yeah. family love cookie time, don't they? They do. They do. Yeah. She, my son just popped in earlier and was like, I want a cookie time. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they uh, definitely look forward to having cookie time. When I come back from Tokyo and I've been to the Harajuku uh, cookie time shop and stocked up on some some cookies as well. So. Thank you. Where are you based, Jane, by the way? Sorry. This might not yeah, be I'm, up, I'm up in Fukushima in Iwaki City oh. on the coast. So yeah. we, can, we go down to Tokyo you know, for a day trip or, or something sometimes. And yeah, we hit Harajuku and we're like, okay, let's get some cookie times while we're here. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, next time you're here, please um, let me know. So be yeah, to see you. will do. Yeah, that'd be great to see you in person. Well, wow, wow. Well, well, you've been giving us mind-blowing information. Mm-hmm. I could, it's obvious to me that for Kiwi people coming into Japan, it's, it's an absolute goldmine waiting to happen. You've got to have those three Ps or that fourth yeah. P as well. Uh, and, you know, just keep on going and keep on trucking. And you can see that from all of your smaller successes, it's really led to even bigger successes. And it's just amazing how much you and Rie have been doing to build this brand in Japan. So again, congratulations, Jason, on being such a successful gentle in Japan. And thank you, thank you so much for telling us all about your journey and tips for success in this land of the rising sun. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you, Jane. It's lovely to be involved. Thank you for reaching out. And yeah, we love to share the story with other Kiwis and we hope to do that in the most transparent way. So any help we can be, um, yeah, we're grateful to be involved. So thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Oh my goodness. What a gold nugget packed episode that was with Jason from Cookie Time here in Japan. What did you wow. talk out for your, your top tips from that episode Catherine if you can keep it to a few oh, he made it so hard he made it so so hard because there's just so much and mm. I really hope people got something out of that I obviously the four p's I mean that were three p's actually but the mysterious missing p what could I that really be? feel it yeah. was like pino but I, I know it could be peanut butter <laughs> I'm not sure but definitely those three it's probably more p's, patience right? again right it's more probably just patience again patience perseverance and persistence my goodness. And you talked about the Nemawashi there as well. Passion for passion? cookies. Probably passion, passion for your product, probably. Hey, Jason, is it passion? Maybe it's passion. Well, um, you think about how he talked about, you know, he just loves all of his products, right? And he's passionate he about them. And I think you have to be passionate yeah, about does. your product, right? He's passionate about products. He's also passionate about New Zealand. It shows through. Mm. And I can see how that combination of him and Rie going out together he talked about that combination, a Japanese person who's passionate about New Zealand and himself. It would have shone through in any of those pitches they were doing. So perhaps it's passion. Mm. There you go. That's it. Well, yeah, aside from the three or four Ps, I loved that he was doing a lot of side hustles before he actually got into what he was doing. And I think that was important for somebody who's in Japan already, maybe a Kiwi wants to start up, just getting your feet in the water, dipping your toes in really seems to be a great thing to do. After all of that, you know, he went through all the challenges and that's also the perseverance of being here in Japan. It takes a long time to get established and remain relevant. That was one of his points as well. So being sure that you um, work through, push through the challenges, don't give up, keep going. Uh, That was a really important point. And, you know, by that you showed that you have passed the test. 
Uh, those little, you can imagine those little buyers going around, having a look in the shops and seeing this product, seeing these products, Kiwi Time, Cookie Time, Kiwi Time, that's a new one, uh, Cookie Time and Tom and Luke on the shelves and saying, we want those, and then coming and approaching. So passing the test, you know, because they got the account, they'd already shown they were in the market, so they must have had that trust. I think that was really key information as well. And also, it was really lovely to hear a shout out to the NZTE. And also yes. New Zealand Food and Beverage, yeah, those yes. organisations that there are for New Zealanders to help them to do this stuff and to not just know that they're there is probably a huge, a huge help. And that, the, especially in Tokyo, the NZT is very approachable when you can get they in sure touch with them. Are. Yeah. They're a great team and it's really important and um, interesting to hear that. And I love that they've got the continuing relationship there. So as things get on in the in the business, they're still there to call on. They're not a one and done. So they're there for the long term, which is absolutely amazing. It's really exciting to see the innovations that they're also doing with actually bringing the bulk product over and then repackaging it to fit the Japanese market. That is very clever. And it's not something you would know from just sitting at your desk in New Zealand. You have to come and see how Japanese people live their lives. And that thing about like the individual wrapping, and it just drives me nuts Mm. about the individual wrapping there's so much waste is created but it is so necessary for the way that Japanese people live their lives and how they want to use products which is to give it to people giving a gift in Japan is is something you do almost on a daily basis and if things are not individually wrapped you cannot buy a whole bag of cookies and then give someone one cookie on their desk in the office and you know, everyone gets one cookie you can't do that if it's not wrapped up. That's just disgusting. This is something that you wouldn't know, right, if you're in New Zealand, that this sure. is how your cookies are going to be used because they're so delicious and they're not necessarily a snack. They're more on a gift level, don't you think? The, I the, do the, think the, that, yeah. 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 So being able to distribute them around the office as a thank you for something or, oh, look, I went to Tokyo and here's a little souvenir, which is something that Japanese people love to do. It's got to be wrapped. Yeah, it's got to be individually wrapped. And so many times I've really struggled when I went back to New Zealand to find something I could bring back to Japan to hand out as a souvenir, no miyage. There's just nothing. But good old Cookie Time does has those little wrapped up ones. Mm. And I would always bring those back and hand them around and people love them. They're very, very appreciated here. So they do love very the Cookie much Time so. taste. Mm. Yeah. And I just, you know, the whole thing there about staying relevant, having a story to tell that's come through on a, a several episodes already. And, you know, keeping up the strong communication with everybody. And I think they're doing that. They're doing that by being there on every occasion. Because those events, mm. as you've just been saying, you know, the events in Japan, mm. right? Valentine's, White Day, Halloween, it may not be so big in other places, maybe you're not even back in New Zealand, but it's so important here. So gift giving on those particular occasions and branding. It's hard work, mm. right? Another packaging, another another push, another brand out there, another event to be celebrating. But it's all very important to stay relevant in Japan as well. Yeah, throughout the whole year. We can't just put your one product <laughs> out and use it all year long. No. <laughs> yeah, it's not just a Christmas cookie box. It's it's all sorts of things, isn't it? Yeah. Here too? Yeah. Right. Good stuff. Phenomenal. Thank, Thank you, you, Jason. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, everyone. Don't forget to use that special code Jandle Time on the Cookie Time website. That's for people in Japan, obviously. And we know that if you have not been able to get home to New Zealand, that you'll be missing your Cookie Time fix. So please make use of that wonderful offer from Jason. It's very, very generous. Very generous. Well, that's all for today. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we'll see you again on the next show. Jane! Matane! Thanks for listening. Make sure you check out our guests' links in the show notes. This podcast is brought to you today by Catherine O'Connell Law and Pod Launch with Jane. If you have a great story you think should be on the show, come and find us on LinkedIn or Instagram. We'd love to hear from you. See you next time. Matane.